passeth by a word with heaven comfort from. And we want to turn to the gospel of Matthew this evening here. Um, if you have a Bible with you, certainly turn with us. If you don't, uh, someone maybe will share with you or maybe you just listen along. But we'll do a very short reading this evening. It's in Matthew's Gospel and Matthew chapter 18. 18 uh, this evening. Just get a wee minute and get your place. And what I want to talk to you about tonight for a wee short time, appreciate everybody needs to get home safely and I'm not going to be in the way of that because I don't want anybody ringing me up tomorrow and says I'm blaming you for whatever <laughs> happens. So... Uh, my insurance doesn't do those things too well. So. <laughs> but I'll keep us very short this evening. But what I want to talk to you about for a short time is when a child becomes your teacher. When a child becomes your teacher. And I want to read these verses, some of them very familiar verses, I would imagine. And it's in Matthew 18. I'm beginning here at verse 1. And it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus. Now, we don't know, was this at a house? Was this in the outdoors? We're not sure the particular setting. But what we do know is that the twelve, those who Jesus had called, those who were called to be his disciples, the fishers of men, those who would bring his kingdom in power, these same men come to Jesus. And they said to him, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Let's just bow and pray a wee minute. And you ask God even to speak to your heart and mind tonight. And he's more than able to do that. And let's just join and pray together. For this happy occasion and this blessing that we can celebrate and we thank you that we can gather together as Lord family, friends, and as the family of God as well, and celebrate your goodness in all things. And gracious Lord, we thank you for this word that we have in front of us, a word of life, a word of encouragement, a word of strength, a word of salvation. And we pray this evening, Father, that Lord, you'll come and just give the honor that your word deserves in our midst. Lord, we pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts and our minds, and we welcome the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that he will speak, Lord, wherever he can speak into our lives. And Lord, do the things that only he can do. And we welcome, Lord, his presence and power. We bring everything unto the obedience of King Jesus in this place. And we pray your kingdom to come and your will to be done. Lord, we lay down our life and pray you'll cleanse us, sanctify us, and fill us, that we would glorify you this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. It's always fascinated me, whenever you look at the life of Jesus and look about how he ministered, Jesus was a master communicator. He had an immense ability to communicate. The purpose of communication is to get the point across. Reminds me a couple of years ago of a preacher and they said he got up and when he began, he knew what he was talking about. And then halfway through the message, the people didn't know what he was talking about. And by the end of the message, he didn't know what he was talking about. And we want to best avoid that tonight. But Jesus was this capable communicator. He didn't have to use big words. He didn't have to use big explanations. But Jesus had this amazing ability of getting the point across. Because Jesus didn't come into the world to give us an opinion about something. Jesus came to give us the message from God. And therefore you need to be clear. And you need to be simple about it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He came to give us a simple, clear direction. How to get to heaven. How to know God personally. How to know your sins forgiven. How to know what life's all about. Jesus was impeccably clear about all those things. In actual fact, people said whenever they heard him, they said no one spoke like this man spoke. Those men who said that, by the way, came to arrest him. <laughs> Imagine these men coming to arrest Jesus and they have to about turn and they come back to their you know, senior officer or whatever it would be and, and they said, well, where is he? And they just said, no man spoke like that man. They were absolutely agog at Jesus speaking. He was a remarkable communicator. Another wee passage says about Jesus, he spoke with authority and not like the scribes. He had a tremendous way of speaking that people that even came to oppose him or resist him, they had to stand back and say, look, you're telling the truth of God. And that's an amazing thing about Jesus. 
But one of the things that really does fascinate me when you read the Gospels is that very often Jesus would speak in a non-verbal way. Some of his most powerful messages didn't have any words connected to them. They were pictures. They were object lessons. They were communications that he didn't have to open his mouth and talk, but he got the message right through. One day they came to him and they said, here, should we pay taxes? And Jesus says, give me a coin. And there with a single coin in his hand, he was able to rebuke his critics and was able to say, pay unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but give unto God the things that are God's. And it says they all fell silent before him. Another occasion, there was an angry mob that wanted to murder a woman who was found in adultery. And there they are with the stones in their hands and they're baying for blood. And what does Jesus do when these men say, Moses says we're to execute this woman. Here's the first stone, Jesus. You go out and kill her. And what Jesus does is he kneels into the ground and he starts to draw. And he just fiddles about and footers in the ground. And there he's, he's doing wee things in the ground. And you'd say, what was that all about? And the Old Testament says, those who reject the fountain of living waters, their names will be written in the dust. And what Jesus was doing to those men, he says, you may have murder in your heart, you think you're holier than thou. He says, because you've rejected me, he says, your names are as good as the dust. I won't hear anything of it. And yet the most powerful thing that Jesus ever did, and it didn't have even any words connected to it, was a cross. He hung on a cross. He didn't say very much over those six hours that he was there. But that cross is the salvation of the world. And I want you to get this amazing picture of Jesus. With a coin, he silences his critics. With a drawing on the ground, he silences mobs. And on a cross, he's willing to save the world. That is who Jesus is. He's the uh, most able communicator there is. Some people say, I've never heard God speak to me. My dear friends, Jesus Christ can speak to any person. Irrespective of whether they're religious, irreligious, whether they're interested or not religious, Jesus has amazing ways of getting through to people. And what we read of tonight is such an example where Jesus would use such a powerful illustration and it was a child. Sometimes we read these things and we just don't really engage our brains. But I want you to think about it. Here was this conversation between Jesus and 12 of his disciples. Maybe a few others were involved, we're not sure. But they asked him a question and they said, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? Come on, Jesus, let's, let's go on an ego trip. Tell me how great I am. Tell us how great we are. Come on, just say a name. Come on, give us a hint. Who's the best, who's the best boy in the group? And what is amazing is that Jesus just completely bypasses them and he walks over into the house. Maybe it was a man's house. Maybe it's a woman's house. And he just takes a toddler. And he lifts the toddler. And he walks into the middle of those 12 men. And he plunks the wee toddler in front of these men. Maybe six foot tall, all of them. And all of them are looking down at the wee child. And Jesus doesn't say very much. And they would have thought, how peculiar. How utterly strange for a man to do that. And Jesus was bringing out a very important point. He was shocking them. And what you will find in your life and mine is whenever Jesus wants to speak to you and I, it is often a shocking thing. You think in your head, I know what it's all about. A lot of people almost honestly presume that they can guess what Jesus is going to say to them. Oh, that you're unclean, that you're not good enough, that you're not worthy, that you're not religious enough or whatever. And you have this in your head that says, well, I expect, you know, if Jesus was to speak to me, it's basically telling me to go to hell. That's what I would expect. And yet, my friend, whenever Jesus starts to speak into your life and mine, he'll tell you things that you never thought you could ever know. He'll start to tell you about things that you never thought were possible. Yes, he will maybe speak about your sin, but he'll tell you about how much he loves you. And he'll speak to you about things that you never thought that were possible. He'll start to speak to you and show you how much he values you, how much he cares for you, how much he actually wants you in his, in his kingdom, how much he wants you to be in heaven with him. Those things are shocking to people. Because they've got a good dose of religion in their hearts and they just say, I don't expect Jesus to speak to me. But when he speaks, it is shocking. It shocks our expectations. And that's exactly what had happened to these men. What I want to notice is a number of wee things tonight. Three wee lessons from this passage that you can take home this evening. First thing I want you to notice is that these disciples, when they came to Jesus, were doing something that may not seem very bad in our thinking. It might just be a bit annoying if someone's all about themselves and trying to promote themselves. But this is something we all do. And I want us to be aware of this. And I want us to basically turn from this. These men were hiding behind their status. These men were hiding behind their status. 
Now, what do I mean by that? What they were basically coming to Jesus and saying was, we're really important people. Well, why would they be saying that? Well, they were his disciples. They were the men that were healing the sick. They were the men sent to cast out demons. They were the men that were sent out to cleanse the lepers, you know, raise the dead, uh, give sight to the blind, recovery of hearing to those who were deaf. In other words, they had a status. They had a status. And, and what they were basically saying is that Jesus, we have this amazing status. Just tell us how successful we are in our status. That's basically what these men were looking for. Now, don't get me wrong. These men believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He had revealed himself as that. They believed that. And not only did they believe in Jesus, but in fact they admired him. They would have looked up to him and said, this is a really important man. But this is the most important point. They trusted in their status rather than in Jesus as their savior. Because whenever they're asking that question, who then is the greatest in the kingdom? What they're saying to Jesus is this. Who's your successor? We don't imagine you, Jesus, to be here forever. You're just going to be like a king in a kingdom and it's going to be there for a short period of time and you're going to pop your clogs and then who's going to be the man who takes over from you? That's not exactly a vote of confidence in Jesus, is it? He had told them, the son of man must suffer many things at the hands of this generation. He will be crucified on the third day. He will rise again. He had told them that. And in their thinking, they're saying, well, if Jesus is out of the picture, who's the next big guy to come in and take the role? They trusted in their status but not in the Savior. And you'd say, well, that's not I do. Oh, yes, it's every, every one of us does this. We assume that we are good people because we have a status. Because I was brought up in a church. And what I want to do is become the greatest in my church. I'm a good Presbyterian as opposed to a bad one. I'm a good Baptist, not a bad Baptist. You know? But somebody would say, no, no, I don't trust in religion. I, I don't trust my status is in religion. I trust that my status is in my Western morality. That we try to do good towards one another. We try to be conscientious. We try to be ethical and charitable and conscientious in our work. We try to care for other people. We try to look out for our neighbors. And we trust in that status and say, that is what makes me a good person. That's what makes me important. That's really what we're saying. Or it could be your work. I've got a good job, that makes me a respectable person. Or you say alternatively, you know, I've got a good bout of money, got a good house, I'm a respectable 5'8", whatever. And you believe that your status is what makes you important or your status is what makes you worthy. And that's what these men were doing. They put their faith in the status, but their faith was not in Jesus as their savior. And that is something that very many people do. They hide in that. But I want to let you know something, friends. That may be impressive in the eyes of each and every one of us here tonight. It may be impressive, funny enough, in the eyes of the society we live in. But one day we must all stand before God. Encounter with God one day. It will not be on this earth, but it will be in eternity. And we have to stand before God. And the Bible says we must give an account of our lives. Our whole lives are going to be presented before the universe. And there is our lives presented before God. And you have to give an answer of how you've lived your life. And you cannot come before God and say, well, I went to a good church. I hid in a church, and that church is what gave me my importance. It doesn't work, because God's going to look through that church and says, I didn't send that church. I sent my son. And you would say, but, but God, I had a good job, and I earned money, and I reared my family, and I did all those things that made me you know, quite a conscientious sort of a person. But God says, I never sent you those works. I sent my son who did a perfect work. And you say, but I, I trusted in my morality. I was a good person. I tried to be the best person, the best version of me possible. But God says, I sent my perfect son. And you see, this is the troubling thing for men and women. We trust in statuses because everybody else around us does. And the whole world trusts that if we hide behind these images, we're trying to hide what's really there in our hearts, which is sin. That's our problem. Doesn't matter how nice we may be, doesn't matter how well we present ourselves, how respectable we may be, but the Bible says there's a heart inside of us that is wicked and it is desperately wicked at that. There's something inside of us. Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we lose our temper? Why are we nasty to people? Why do we bear grudges? Why do we have lusts in our hearts? Why are we selfish? Jesus said, from the heart of man proceeds all manner of evil. That's what Jesus said. 
Jesus indicated to us there is something inside of us that is evil. And we need to receive God's forgiveness. We need to receive the new birth that Jesus promises us, that we can be new people, have a new start and a new beginning from the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, the problem is all of us like to live a little lie. It's trying to dupe ourselves, make ourselves feel a bit better about ourselves. And so we hide behind the statuses. We say, I'm important. I'm pretty important. I'm pretty worthy. Because the alternative is to say, I'm unworthy. I'm a sinner. And that is the one thing a man or woman does not want to admit. But I want to let you know something really good. Jesus Christ only saves sinners. Jesus is only interested in sinners. If we come to Jesus and say, I'm a good enough person, Jesus says, well, I'm really sorry. I can't save you. I can't have a relationship with you. But I have not come to call the righteous. I have come to call sinners to repentance. You can't, you can't come to God and say, well, I'm good enough. There's one main man the Bible talks about. He's called the rich young ruler. He says, I've kept all the commandments from my youth. He was a real goody two-shoes. He was a real good boy, wasn't he? And he comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to have eternal life? He knew there was an emptiness inside of him. He knew there was something lacking. Even though he had been brought up in synagogue, brought up in a good church, brought up in a good upbringing, so to speak. But he knew something was missing because he didn't have assurance he had eternal life. He had no assurance he was going to heaven. And what was amazing was that Jesus turns around and he says to him, why do you call me good? Because he said, good master, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. See, all of us profess ourselves as good people. And the reason why we call ourselves good is we compare ourselves to somebody up the road who's been thrown in jail last week. And we say, well, I'm better than him. That's okay, you may be. I'm not taking that away from you. But when you compare yourself to God, when I compare myself to God, I'm not a good man. I'm not a good man. I'm a cruel man. I'm a very harsh man. I'm a wicked man. That's by my own confession. You have to make up your own mind about that yourself. But we hide behind statuses and not trusting in Jesus as our Savior. This is the beautiful thing then, secondly. Jesus, when he's asked this question, who is the most important? He passes their question completely. Jesus had a habit of that, you know. Jesus had a tremendous habit of not answering the person's particular question, but he then turned and answered their heart. And what he does here is he totally bypasses these questions. He doesn't say, oh, it's Peter. He doesn't say, it's John doesn't say, well, give it five months and you'll be the next big shot in the kingdom. No. He just saunters over to the other side of the room. He picks up a toddler, lifts the toddler, places the toddler in the midst of them all, and he just says there. And you say, what's that all about? What's that whole business about? He explains it then in verse 3. He says, assuredly, I say to you. Literally, that means, amen, amen. I am telling you, and he's speaking as God's man, God's representative. He is speaking out of a place of utter solemnity, utter authority, and utter power. And he makes known to the disciples a really important message. What is this? Look at the end of verse 3. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What was Jesus saying to these men that was so serious? He says, men, you're debating about who's the greatest in the kingdom. But the bigger question is, are you in the kingdom? Are you in the kingdom? Unfortunately, today, there's many people playing games outside the kingdom of God. Who can be the most important? Who can be the most wealthy? Who can be the most influential? Who can be the most successful? And we're diddly and dallying about those things. And we're doing that game on the very precipice of eternity. We're playing this little game. Who's the biggest person? Who's the most important person? Who's the most successful person? And we're tinkering on the edge of a lost eternity. Who wants to be the most successful before one would be damned? What a stupid game to play. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You could be the life's winner and win, 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 win all the way to one's death. And if you do not have Christ... You become the ultimate loser. You lose the thing that's most important, according to Jesus, and it's the soul. That part of you that lives on forever and ever, and it could have lived with God in heaven, 
and perfect righteousness, but you lost it. You lost it because you trusted in the little games, but you didn't enter into the kingdom. Friends, I would rather be a poor man in the kingdom of God than a rich man out of it. I would rather be a scoundrel in the kingdom of God than a so-called moral man outside of it. I would rather be a man that is forgotten and overlooked than to be famous outside of it. It's like the old hymn that says, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather be his than of riches untold. I'd rather have him than worldwide fame than to be the king of a vast domain and live in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus. That's the fundamental thing. These men were trying to work out who was the greatest. Jesus says, men, wrong question. Wrong question. It's not how important you are, how big you are, how special you are. The question is, are you in the kingdom? Well, how is that possible? Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. The event by which somebody enters into God's kingdom is not baptism, not confirmation, not church attendance, but there must be a supernatural event in the life of a man or a woman when God Almighty opens their eyes and they realize that Jesus Christ died for them on the cross. That it's not just general, but it is specific. And Jesus has died for that individual. And they put their complete confidence in what Jesus did for them. As soon as a man puts his faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus gives the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the life of Jesus comes into that soul and they become alive. And they enter into God's kingdom and there they are, part of it, here and now. I'm thankful for the day and the hour the Lord saved me. I'm thankful for the day when I was called out of the darkness and called into the light of the kingdom of God. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that tonight I'm not stuck in darkness. Because when you come into God's kingdom, it's not always easy. There's opposition, there's tribulation, there's trials, there's setbacks, there's tears, there's things like that. But I'd rather have that with Jesus than to live without the kingdom and without Jesus. I'd rather have him. And Jesus says to these men, don't miss out on the kingdom of God. Don't miss out on the kingdom of God. The final wee thing I want to leave with you this evening is the lesson of the child. The lesson of the child here tonight. What Jesus does, according to verse 3, takes the wee child, plonks the wee child in the middle. Of it. There must have been red faces. There must have been so much embarrassment with these grown men arguing about who was the greatest. And here they're looking down in the eyes of the wee toddler, in the eyes of the toddler looking back at them. And they would have said, what's this all about? Jesus says to the men, except you become like this little child. In fact, Jesus says, except you are converted and become as a little child, you can't have any part of the kingdom. Why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus talk about that? Very simple. Salvation and entering into God's kingdom is a childlike experience. Someone has said salvation is as like ABC. You must admit that you're a sinner. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for you and rose again. And you must confess him. That's a very childlike thing, isn't it? It's a very childlike thing to be honest. One thing about a child is when you put a certain amount of pressure on a child, a child will tell you the truth. It doesn't matter if it's good, bad or ugly. A child has an amazing grip of the truth. <laughs> It'll say, I don't like you. I don't like that. Now you have to say to the child, now don't, don't, don't embarrass us. To say if you don't, just give it to me. I don't talk to somebody and say you don't like it. But the child says, I don't like it. I'm about to tell a story when I'm not allowed to. So <laughs> that's what it's about. <laughs> Children are entirely honest. The problem is when you become an adult, you become totally dishonest. And you play games with the truth and you manipulate the truth and you try to say, well, it's not quite like that. What God's looking for is childlike honesty. To admit that you're lost. To admit that you've failed. To admit that you've made a mess of it. I remember years ago when I was a wee boy in the farm. I was working outside and took a wee spade and was digging at something stupid. I don't know what I was doing. But here didn't the shaft of it break. And I went and I panicked. I thought, I'm in trouble. If my dad finds I've broken this, this spade or whatever it was, I'm in deep trouble. And I hid it under a, 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 under a shed. I put it under a, a porta a port, a port cabin or something. And here didn't the man start to talk. He says, where's that spade going? And I says, I haven't seen it. 
I didn't see it now. No, I didn't see it at all. And somebody says, no, I saw you with it there the afternoon. No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me now. Until Red Face Muggins has to own up and says it was me that broke it and I hit it and all. He says, why were you wanting to hide that from us? Because I was afraid I would be in trouble. You see, friends, that's what often people's experience is before they become Christians. They're so scared to admit they're sinners because they're afraid they're going to get judged. They're afraid that they're going to have to feel unworthy. But a child is honest. And you have to be honest with God. You can't be dishonest. You can't play games. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus. A child is very trusting. You go to a wee child and says, I've been to the moon today. The child says, well, that's amazing. How do you do that? And you could, you could create a whole elaborate story and a child would say, well, that's amazing. Somebody says, well, I can't believe in old stories and myths. The Bible isn't such a thing. This word is historically true, proven by archaeology, proven by the prophecies of the Old Testament, proven by the miracles of Jesus, proven by the morality that Jesus taught and preached, proven by the resurrection. Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And if Christianity was a lie, it would have died out 2,000 years ago. But the fact he is the way, the truth, and the life, no man can come to the Father except it is through him. That is what all of us have to admit, and we believe in him. Instead of trusting in ourselves, in our society, in our church, in our works, we put 100% confidence in the Lord Jesus. And you know what he does? The Bible says whoever believes in the Lord is saved. He reaches out to you and I, and he says, I will hold you to myself. I had a wee lady came to me this morning in church, deeply concerned about issues in her life. And she says, I'm so, I'm so scared about where I'm going. I'm so scared about how I am. I said to her, if you look at yourself, you'll always be miserable. But I find every time I look at Jesus Christ, my heart is cheered. And I told her, stop looking at yourself. Look to Jesus alone. And that wee woman, as she came in sad, she left the wee place with a big smile on her face. And she says, I'll keep looking at Jesus then. That's the key to salvation. Don't look at yourself. Don't look at others. Don't look at anything else. Look at him. He's died. He's rose again. It's a done deal. Trust in him and he'll sort you out. You must then confess Christ. Children are very, very loyal. They'll say, that's my mummy, that's my daddy, that's my best friend. And they're very loyal. They'll confess it before others. So it's true of anybody that's a Christian. They confess Christ. They tell other people, I have trusted in Christ. And he's my saviour as well. And from that moment, it doesn't mean you're an infant. It doesn't mean that you're an infantile moron or fool or something. No, you're still an adult. You pay your bills. You go and do what's sensible. But you have a childlikeness in your heart. Jesus said you have to humble yourself. You have to become like a little child. And you have to trust in God. You have to become teachable. You have to become a, a, wee, a wee heart that's saying, I'm open. That's what a disciple of Jesus looks like. It's just childlike following of God. And that's what the Lord's looking for. Jesus took the wee child. And that was the message that these men needed to learn. In fact, Jesus uses a very controversial wee word there in verse 3, doesn't he? He says the word converted. I find it really funny when a man or woman comes and says, you won't be converting me. Right? You won't be converting me. And I often say to these people, says, do you know how many people I've converted in my life? One says, hundreds. I says, big. says, well, you're pretty useless. I says, yes, I am. But it's Jesus who saves hearts. Jesus uses the word convert. You know why? Because it really digs at something that really is in all of us. It's our pride. It's that part of us that's really stubborn. That says, I will not change. And I will not be told what to do. And I will not be told what I need to do. I'm going to do it my own way. I'll tell you a wee illustration of this. It's always a good illustration when the preacher looks good out of this. But this is what happened. I was brought up with my sister. And the two of us, you would hardly thought the two of us were brought up in the same house. My sister, when she was a toddler, she would have said, I'll do it myself. My mum tried to dress the child, tried to feed the child, tried to sort out the child. She says, no, I'll do it myself. Well, I was the good boy. I says, do whatever you need to do. I'll just trust you. Do whatever you need to do. Feed me, clothe me, bathe me, do whatever you want. And it only stopped when I was about 30 years of age. <laughs> Got married. That <laughs> That's the attitude that you need to have if you become a Christian. Unless Jesus does it and saves you and works in your life, you can't do it yourself, friend. 
That's where he uses that word convert and people's backs go up and they get all annoyed about it. But he knows what he's doing. He's a good communicator. He says you need to humble yourself. You need to learn to depend not on you or whatever you're trusting. You trust in me and I'll sort you out. I'll look after you. I'll care for you. I'll be good to you. What we must all do this evening is follow the example of the wee child. Just simply put our trust in Jesus and ask him to save us. And those who trust him, they find him wholly trustworthy. He never fails us. He never disappoints. And he says, those who come to me, he says, I'll never cast you out. I'll never forsake you. He's so kind, he's so warm. I loved it last week. There was a wee woman we had to go and see. She was an alcoholic. Totally broken life. Absolutely falling apart. She came from a Catholic background. Immaterial, but that was just on it. And we shared with her the gospel and we said, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, there was a man beside him and he said, Lord, would you remember me? And I says, that was the first man that was ever promised heaven. There he was, a man nailed to a cross, a guilty sinner like that. And he trusted Jesus and Jesus says, you'll be with me in heaven. And she says that, she says, but I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And yet, you know, it was the most beautiful thing. As God began to work in her heart, she just give her life to Christ there and then. And all the arguments are saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. It, it, it wiped away in the presence of God. And a simple childlike faith was exerted in a grown woman who had a lot of problems, but she simply trusted Christ. And from there on, others could note and they said, there's something different. We can see something's happening. She was beginning to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. You know, one last thing I'll say, and I find this beautiful. Jesus says, if a man is born again, he inherits the kingdom of God. Do you know when you think of it, if you hold, held a wee child in your arms there, and you looked in its eyes and you saw its wee cherub-like face and you said to yourself, boy, it's hard to believe it's going to grow up to be a scoundrel. It's going to be brat in five years' time. He'd be shouting at it and roaring at it and bamboo canes everywhere. <laughs> you know, this wee tear away there. It's hard to believe that, that that wee face that just would say innocence would then turn around and be an absolute <laughs> horrible wee thing sometimes. You know, of course, they're all, they're all uh, somebody says, my child's an angel, and someone says, so is Lucifer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the beautiful thing when you look in the face of a newborn babe, you just see innocence. And Jesus said, if anybody comes to me and is born again, he says, I give you the gift of innocence. I totally forgive you of everything. And in your heart of hearts, it's as white as snow. You're free. That's the beauty of what the Lord does for each one who trusts in him. Let's just bow and let's pray tonight. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, it's as simple as saying, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died and rose again for me. And I confess him to be my Savior and my Lord. And he'll save you if you ask him to. And he'll come into your life this evening. He can do it as simple as that. It's not complicated. It's not difficult. Thank God it's not difficult. It's not a ritual. It's not some pilgrimage. It's not some big religious effort. It's simply trusting Jesus. And you trust him for every day of your life. So let's just pray a wee second here. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for how you've come, Lord God, to do what was impossible for us all. Lord, to take away sin, to take away guilt, to take away failure. Lord, none of us could do it. But we just thank you, Lord, as you hung on a cross. Lord, you banished sin once and forever. We thank you, Lord, that you rose again from the grave, a triumphant Savior. And Lord, you have the power to rescue any life, any person, any situation. We thank you, Lord, there's nothing more powerful than death defeated. And tonight, Lord, we just bless everyone here this evening, family, friends, and those from James and Rochelle's family, friends, and Lord, who may be here tonight, we bless each and every one. And we pray tonight, Lord, if there would be a one life or one person that has never known the wonder of, Lord, knowing their sins forgiven, of knowing a real relationship with you, Lord, we pray that you'd grant that to them even by the end of the night, that, Lord, your love would be so real for them, and, Lord, you'd lead them to yourself, Lord. Sealing your word into our hearts and minds, we pray, and we thank you, Lord, for this wee time together. In Jesus' name.